Yeah, we're doing naive Bayes classification today. Chapter 14, nearly at the end. Nearly at the end. So we've done well. Uh, I mean, right. the, the, the hierarchical part are the sexy part. That's yeah. all we want now. After the classification, obviously. <laughs> so don't worry about the first one. Um, that's just loading the packages and the, and the data. Um, so it's, it's all in the text. You just load it up, it's all fine. We've all done that before. Um, and so once you've done that, what have we got? We've got penguins. We've got an awful lot of penguins. I don't know what the collective noun for penguins is. It's probably a David Attenborough of penguins, but we've got lots of them. I think it's 344. And that's what we're going to be using <laughs> to do our data analysis. We've got Adelie penguins, Chinstrap penguins, and Gen 2 penguins. So it's all the penguins I've ever heard of and some more. Uh, right. OK. So why would three lovely species of penguins be a problem? Previously, we have used logistic regression for classification. Uh, logistic regression is based on a binary classification of response variables, i.e. 0 or 1, heads or tails, win or lose. You know, it, you've got two options, you haven't got three. So uh, the, mathematical, sorry, the mathematical whiz kids amongst you, which to be fair is all of you, um, will have noticed that we have three species of penguins. Um, so what can we use instead of logistic regression? Well, the answer, surprisingly, uh, is naive phase classification. OK, so why should we use naive Bayes classification? So there are three benefits. Uh, it can be used to classify categorical, categorical response variables with two or more categories. So it doesn't have to be three. You can use it uh, on more. It doesn't require much theory beyond Bayes rule, hence the name. It's computationally efficient. It doesn't require um, MCMC simulation. Uh, it does have some drawbacks, which we can go into later. Um, so this is using one categorical uh, predictor. And what we're trying to predict is what type of um, uh, penguin uh, we've got. So uh, here we're looking at the above average weight. So if they're above average weight, um, there are one. It was that greeny kind of tealy sort of sort of color, uh, and the more uh, ready color is that they are below average weight, uh, and that's the code for it there. Uh, right, but uh, that is not the full story for Bayesians, because also we need to look at the numbers of three species. So you'll see. From the last one, it was quite obvious um, that the thinnest penguins would have been the chinstrap penguins, uh, but there aren't very many of them. The Adelie penguins, there's an awful lot more. So the number that you need to concentrate on is the 193 there. So those zeros are the penguins that are not above average weight. They're the thin penguins. So. Um, we can see that the chinstrap penguin is the most likely not to be above average weight, uh, but we can also tell from the prior information, uh, that should be information, I've typed it as inflation, oh dear. Uh, never mind. inflation <laughs> in the UK. Uh, about the numbers of the three species that the chinstrap has a smallish population. So with 193 penguins uh, being below average weight, 126 are uh, Adelis, which gives a 65% chance of a below average weight penguin being a Adeli. So if it's below average weight penguin, it's most likely uh, to be in a deli one. Okay, so what would be the most likely species if the information we had about it was it had a 50 millimeter long bill? Um, you'll have to excuse um, the Y axis being chopped off. I don't know why it's chopped off. But basically that dashed line is the 50 millimeter line. Uh, so looking at the plot, you would probably say that the most likely option would be the uh, chin strap rather than the Gen 2. At least a bit of a toss up between the two. Definitely not an, uh, an Adeli one because their bills are a lot shorter. Uh, so. 
Oh, okay, all right. Um, yeah, so assumptions, the naive Bayes uh, method typically assumes that any quantitative predictor here is continuous and uh, conditionally normal. That is, within each species, bill lengths are normally distributed with possible different means and standard deviations. Mm. And yeah, we can check the assumptions with that bit of code. Uh, and you can plot that out. Um, this is what it says in the book. They look they look a bit neater that way. Um, apparently that's okay, because this is what it says in the book. Um, plotting the tuned normal models uh, for each species confirms uh, that this naive Bayes assumption isn't perfect. It's a bit more idealistic than the density plots of the raw data uh, in the earlier plot. Uh, but they say it's fine enough continu to continue. So if they're happy, then I'm happy. Um, right. So why is the normality assumption important? Recall that this normality assumption provides the mechanism we need to evaluate the likelihood of observing a 50 millimeter long bill amongst each of the three species. This likelihood corresponds to the normal density curve heights uh, at a bill length of 50 millimeters. Thus observing a 50 millimeter long bill is slightly more likely among chinstrap uh, than Gen 2 and highly unlikely among Delhi penguins. And you can calculate the likelihoods with the following code. Uh, in the results, you can see the Adeli ones there, very, very unlikely, uh, about 11% uh, for chin straps and nine uh, for the gentrues. So there's not a vast amount of difference between those two. Right. So based on bill length, what is this? Uh, now, I'm looking at the 50 millimeter here. I thought that was a bit of a tie when I looked at that, but that's not what the book says. But I thought it was a tie and I plotted it. Um, okay, so based on bill length, what is this penguin? It follows from our naive Bayes classification based on our prior information and the penguin's bill length alone, that this penguin is a Gen 2. It has the highest uh, posterior probability though uh, a 50 millimeter long bill is relatively less common among Gen 2 than among Chinstrap. The final classification was pushed over the edge by the fact that the Gen 2 are much more common in the wild. So that's a kind of quite a common theme. They do take into account the numbers uh, with this. Yeah, for, for that, they assume like the sample is representative of the... Um, yeah, general population. population. Yeah. <clears throat> Like the, the number of the sample is a good good uh, representation of the. I don't know how they're going to the get all of the penguins in the entire world and, and count them. So it's I suppose it's going to have to be representative, roughly, isn't it? The um, sampling method must be good. We have to trust them. <laughs> yeah, I mean, three hundred and forty-four penguins sounds like a job, to be honest. Um, so it's, yeah. No idea. <laughs> uh, right. Okay. So the next section is two predictors. Can more predictors improve accuracy? And what we're going to be looking at is a penguin which has um, on the y-axis over there a 50 millimeter bill length, uh, and I think it's 195 flipper length. Uh, so it's probably going to end up being a chin strap because that's going to be in the green uh, there. Uh, but as you can see, they're quite closely defined groups. Some of them do overlap a bit, but they are kind of um, quite good model material, basically. It's a, you know, if, if you go and find some data in the wild, it may well not look that neat, basically. Uh, okay, so the species are fairly distinguishable when we can, uh, when we combine the information about uh, bill and flipper lengths. Our penguin uh, with a 50 millimeter long bill and 195 millimeter long flipper represented at the intersection of the dashed lines. The code that they gave for the, um, uh, the previous plot didn't include anything for dashed line, so apologies about that. Um, but yeah, basically the dashed line puts it right amongst the chin strap observations. So um, it generates the posterior probability that the penguin is a chin strap of 99.44%. So that's very likely. Uh, right. 
And basically, yeah, section two was about implementing, implementing and evaluating a naive Bayes classification. So instead of the stand GLM function, we're going to use the naive Bayes one, uh, and it's from a package called E1071. Uh, we just need to input the a formula and which data to use. I'll show the code in a minute. It's it's quite easy. There's no it's, need it's, for. It's probably one of the worst package name, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> it, it it sounds like the the, the 500 million star in uh, some galaxy that we've 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 you know that we're never going to explore in the next million years. So yeah. Um, so. Uh, as there's no need for MCMC simulation, we don't need to worry about a separate prior. Um, we're going to make two models. The first will classify species based on bill length only. The second combines bill length and flipper length. So there's the code. It's, yeah, it's not complicated. Basically, I'm, you know, you're all capable. Um, okay. And we can use the models to classify our penguin uh, from the previous section. So this infamous penguin um, has the bill length of 50 millimeters and a flipper length of uh, 195. Okay, so with these models, how do they make a prediction? Basically, the classification follows a simple rule. They classify the penguin based on whichever species has the highest posterior probability. Um, which is, as you would expect, it, it, it's good to know that. Uh, right, and yeah, so uh, based on bill length alone, our best guess is that the penguin is a Gen 2. So they've done the prediction there. It's basically 60% Gen 2, well, 60% of the bit, and just under 40% um, being a chin strap penguin, and it's highly unlikely that it's, it's going to be uh, an Adeli one, but that's only based on one predictor. Um, because they're trying to give us the right answer here, um, when as soon as we add the next predictor in, the results change dramatically. Um, so basically, the Adeli is still out of the game. Um, the Gen 2, it's definitely not um, like the Gen 2 because the Gen 2s have a different um, flipper length and it becomes much more likely that it's a chin strap. So measuring prediction accuracy, the measures, uh, the methods that we used are basically the same as logistic regression. Uh, so there are confusion matrices, uh, which compare the observed species with the prediction generated by the model, and also the same cross validation that we've used before. Uh, so, uh, which is more useful to gain a sense of, uh, sorry, well, that should be how. Uh, the model will deal with new penguins uh, and if it's suffering from being overfitted. Right, so this is the code for the confusion matrices. Um, it's all in the book. It's a bit complicated than the, um, the formula for the models, but yeah, it's copy and paste in the book really, so it's not too, too bad. Uh, that tibble at the bottom uh, shows the confusion matrix. Um, so it has the species and then it has models of the first, the yeah, predictions of the first model, and then the predictions of the uh, the second model, uh, and then you can just table them all up. So this is the first model. Uh, the first model is quite good at predicting Adelie penguins. It can identify them ninety five percent of the time. It's also not too bad at Gen two penguins. You can get them right eighty eight percent of the time. It's terrible at identifying chin straps. It thinks they're all Gen 2s. Basically, can only get chin straps right 8.82% 8 of the time, which is rubbish. Um, but as soon as you put the flipper length in from our uh, second model, it all gets a lot better, uh, basically. So the chin straps have been correctly identified. At least 86%, nearly 87% of them are correctly identified. Uh, and the other ones have gone up slightly as well. So what do the results say? The results say that model two is better than model one. This is because the classification rate is only 76% overall in model one, but model two can successfully predict 95% of penguins, which is a lot of penguins. Um, the greatest improvement is with the chin straps. Uh, 
so nine percent as opposed to like about 85 in the next one mm. and that's the code for doing the cross um, validation it's got 10 folds there um, okay and that's roughly the same as uh, model two so it, it is the cross validation for model two there's not it's not using model one it's using model two um, so the accuracy rates in this cross validated uh, confusion matrix are comparable to those in the non cross validated confusion matrix above this implies that our uh, naive Bayes model appears to perform nearly as well on new penguins as it does on the original penguin sample that we used to build this model uh, okay so naive Bayes versus logistic regression while naive Bayes has benefits of being able to predict more categories, the things you lose can also be important. Uh, so naive Bayes doesn't give the same information about predictors as logistic regression. So if you want information about specific predictors, you should use logistic regression. Um, obviously, you can try both until you get the answer you want, um, which is kind of what the book was saying. Um, but yeah, I'm sure plenty of statistical modelers have tried to weevil the model to get them get the result that they want um right and then yeah chapter summary naive Bayes is a good way of classifying category response variables uh, but it does rely on assumptions of the predictors being uh, conditionally independent and when predictors are quantitative they are normally distributed um, this can limit its robustness with real world data so use with caution but yeah it's quite easy it's it's roughly what we've seen before. Yeah, it's still yeah. good. I mean, um, I, a lot of stuff are still normally distributed. Like, it's not like, <laughs> especially like metrics like eight uh, yeah. and stuff like that, uh, big size or whatever. Is like, this is usually like normally distributed, but yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I think, I think you can. Um, uh, Federico would probably know more about this with the feature engineering book um, but I think you can if something isn't normally distributed you can um, change is it log transformation you can use to make it normally distributed and stuff like that it's one of the it's one of the options you have more but this one is also an option log transform <coughs> negative log transform uh, but yeah <laughs> Rebecca is not here anymore. She disappeared. Yeah, I'm here. <laughs> Are you? Uh, I'm here. Okay. I don't see you. In yeah, yeah. Here. Yeah, I agree with you. In your slug. <laughs> slug. Basically, this yeah. is what everyone's saying. Your slug. <laughs> it's reduced. It's it's um it's also used because like a lot of time when you have small probability, very very small. Uh, it's avoid you being in two narrow space when you are doing likelihood and stuff like that. So it's, you know, this is, yeah, log is very powerful, but you have to transform it again. It's not necessarily easy to interpret in the logarithm. At least for me, I always need like a bit of time to think about it. But, yeah. yeah. So basically, I, I haven't looked at the hierarchical models yet, but I suspect this is like the easy end of end of this so i'm sure the hierarchical modules will be a bit more difficult yes this is eric next week <clears throat> i i think the first chapter will be easier actually <clears throat> oh okay so um but then um I, I i was multitasking a little bit so i was googling on stuff um that were relevant to the discussion so uh, 10 points go to whoever has a correct guess. No Googling, I Googled, I, I'm the cheater. One cheater is enough. Uh, 10 points go, goes to whoever uh, can figure out why it's called E1071, the package. Oh. I, I also Googled, so I'm out. <laughs> <laughs> so what, what does it sound like? Like what, what, what could be like, what have you encountered previously in it your life? It that sounds like a food additive. It, food additive is good, I agree. I mean, those usually go in the 100 range, but uh, yeah. Could, <laughs> like, it's, someone it's needed to classify stuff, that. Uh, it's, it's, it's the previous name of a stats department. 
Oh. Mm. And they have like this, they, they had their own like convenience package of a broad range of convenience R functions and they made it into a package. It was a okay. technical university in Vienna. But then the other thing, and then which is just uh, interesting what I just think about, like, I mean, it's native base and it uses base rule, but then uh, my understanding is that when you evaluate then the model, you look at this sort of either confusion matrices or this sort of like receiver operation characteristic or area under the curve sort of type of yeah. binary classifier, uh, which which really feels, I mean, it's, it's using base rules to clear its Bayesian, but uh, like no, no, what is it called? Like no uncertainty intervals on the predictors and nothing like that. It, it doesn't really, I mean, to me, it doesn't really feel Bayesian, even though it obviously is Bayesian. It's based on Bayesian. I mean, well, what mm -hmm. do you think? The, the whole trick is doing is saying like the sample, uh, the repartition of the sample is the repartition of the population, of the whole population. I think the whole trick is here. I mean, one of the trick is here is saying like you don't have uncertainty because like you are sure like what's inside of your sample represents the population. This was my guess, but. Because you're not doing inference towards a general thing, because it just applies to what you have. Yeah, is that okay. what you're saying? The also, and also because they said it. This is one of the, you know, on the list of stuff they said, they said like, the sample represents well the population. It's not drawing into it. It's not a sample like you, you, you use denom a bit, but that's it. Because it's normal and you can, basically use the normal distribution and and do it and because like yeah you are you i don't know this is this to me this is why it doesn't feel that much i agree with eric doesn't feel that much bayon because you have no uncertainty because like you said this is the naive part of it <clears throat> i guess you, you you are sure like what you get what you have is a representation of the world the whole world the big one but yeah, I'm, I'm fine with that. It's just like, <laughs> yeah, practice is gold. Practice is gold. So you, you, you do apply the, the things that you find the book and then with different examples and then you, yeah, my get the things. Um, the, the way they are. So it's it's quite it's simple to when you when you got the book, and so you you follow. So it's simple, uh, you know. It's understandable somehow when you got the book because you follow the the instruction that they say. And but then uh, you need to apply this to different data, and it's a challenge sometimes because they are, they are different. So you need to yeah. transform the data and then apply the model. Uh, and uh, the purpose of the model is also very important. So what are you going to predict? Uh, you, can you uh, just you know, apply a model or you may uh, want to uh, apply a, 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 a range of different models? So, you know, it's, it's um, I think it's, do, mm, doing mm, a certain number of times with different data, uh, it's 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 very important to get inside the meaning of the um, this kind of predictions because probability is tricky some somehow. So, oh, yeah. so yeah. <laughs> no, but I, I like it like this naive uh, Bayesian classification because like you know you can start with it also. I think it's a good uh, base ground model when you are doing some classification task. And then uh, after you can like maybe bring more like the hierarchical model we will see or the kind of stuff. I think like, you know, it's like basic. <clears throat> I like also like when you start even without like, because like what we have seen on the book first was like <clears throat> learning from the data without any predictors. Then we added predictors like a linear model is like adding predictors to the outcome variable. Now we are doing like it for <clears throat> regression and classification. And next time we will advance a bit more 
with a more uh, hierarchical modeling. So I think it's the, I mean, to me at least, and that's why I also like this naive Bayesian classificator. It's like, maybe I need, I need to start something quick to show my boss, I can do that. <laughs> and then I can like, it's a selling point also, a good selling point for like, okay, we can add stuff, you know. So I think, and also for myself, uh, as a practitioner, not necessarily confident uh, in my skills, uh, it's allow me like to <clears throat> learn, uh, like start with something easy and upscale a bit and learn more. I don't know. Well, I think it's I think it's a good principle in statistical modeling. If it's simple and it works, stick with something simple. <laughs> you know, if if you can do a good prediction with like two variables, you don't need to add in a hundred. It's not going to get any better. Yeah, I agree. So uh, yeah, I yeah, a... I will, I'm. Oh, sorry. No, so I just um, I got stuck a bit on this thing with with uh, uh, uncertainty in the predictions. So there's this book called Regression and Other Stories. I haven't read all of it, yeah, but I think it's a masterpiece. Uh, from what I've read, it's a masterpiece. So what they say is that if you have a logistic model, it essentially looks like alpha plus beta x, where x is your, your, your predictor. Yeah. Then if, if um, uh, uh, yeah, like if, the, if the, co the coefficient of income has an estimate beta hat of 0 to 33 and a star standard error of 0, 0, 6, Thus, the data roughly cons consistent with values of B in the range 0, 0.33 plus minus 2 uh, times 0, 0, 0.06. Um, so essentially, my understanding is that you can, from the, from the uncertainty you get when you do a MCMC estimation using the logistic regression, you get uncertainty estimates for the coefficients. And then it seems that you should be able to, to, I haven't thought about this long and hard enough though, but it seems like you should be able to get an uncertainty in the final estimation uh, by, by adding the plus minus uh, to standard deviation. And if you look at the, I looked at Wikipedia on the expected value of the algebra. So if you have more estimates, it looks like if you have like expected value of X plus Y is the same as expected value of X plus expected value of Y. So it essentially, I guess that, went a bit wild and confusing, but essentially it seems that there is a way to get uncertainty in the estimates if you use logistic regression. Yes. Yep. Uh, and then, uh, I mean, other than just confusion matrices and like this area under the curve or like receiver operation characters, which you can of course use as well, but that you can actually look at like, you know, what is the MCMC sampling of the coefficients? Like what, what do we get? And that sounds like something that, yeah, it seems that you can't get from the naive base. No. So, yeah. yeah. No, because you don't do MCMC. You are not simulating anything. You are just drawing from like the normal distribution. <clears throat> I think. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's right. I mean, basically, it's a case of um, looking at your problem and picking which tool can best satisfy what you want out of it. Um, so if you definitely want the uncertainty estimates, you're gonna to have to find a way of using logistic regression. If you've got like um, five different species that you wanna classify, then naive base is probably a better way to go. Yeah, I am like, uh, I don't know if you know this application, Plantanet. It's an application that uh, uh, use supposedly deep learning to classify a plant with a, a huge database of plant images, plant in it. And uh, I can write the name like uh, on the chat. It's, I think it's, it's, it's like that plum, that net, something like that. And um, I think it's provided also, also the percentage of confidence that is, it, 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 they said it's like that. So like, let's say like you get your smartphone, you take a picture of a plant and it tell you like, oh, it could be like uh, this one at 45, this one at 44, 
but it's not. <laughs> it's hard to tell what the difference between like a confidence between 44 and a confidence between like 43. Because, you know, it's it's it doesn't even like sum to one unlike like the what the example we have seen so it's kind of like at one point the users need to say like okay the this is the most uh, it's not even probability like you don't know what it is just telling you like it's if it was probability it will sum to one so we will know like at least uh, but no you can have values value at 40 for example like three to four so it's it doesn't add up but it's it's interesting. Like it's it it probably use deep learning or something like that uh, with neural network. But uh, it, at least if you want to think about like the in the naive Bayesian like uh, classification, it's a bit to one, which I like it. So you can decide it if uh, at one point, like for example, we had the Gen two and the other penguin, they were quite close in the prediction, summing to one. So you know you can you can also like have a more guesses uh because of that also like okay this prediction like it's it's a coin flip uh but yeah i don't know <laughs> so it's just my random thought no no i think it makes a lot of sense but that's sort of i mean i guess that ties back to like native base it feels more like machine learning rather than based on statistics yeah but that's good, no? I can add that to my resume. <laughs> <laughs> Machine learning best practitioner. Yeah, add your state base. Yeah, I'm doing it. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, guys, uh, do we have other stuff to add? Or? I, I think Federica and I spoke at the same time. So, so oh, you were sorry. about to say something, right, Federica? Uh, okay, I'm okay with that. So that's that's uh, we 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 will talk more about that next time. Yeah, that's okay. Um, so you uh, if we have a bit of time, do you want will like me to show you how to Git stuff or to set up Git or or if it's bother you like we don't do it and it's fine with me, I can drink coffee and with milk. <laughs> um. <laughs> Cafe au lait, right? Cafe au lait, voilà. Uh, I think that's okay. I've, I've survived without it. Okay, enough. that's good. Yeah. I mean, I'm not like one to enforce it at all. It's just like, um, I think uh, uh, for like people in the job market, it's good to have a Git history, a GitHub history. So that's why I kind of want to enforce it a bit. But if you are not in this need, like, and if you're, you know, you're fine without it and surviving without it, like. <laughs> yeah. No, I'm going to be doing a little website. So I've been doing some stuff for that. Um, oh. I don't know if you've heard of Michael Palin. He was a, he was, he was a, um, he, he was, he was one quarter of Monty Python uh, back oh. in the day. But then um, he's done like lots of travel documentaries. So I've managed to do state visualization where I've plotted all of the countries um oh. that has been to all over the world by by each individual series as well and then all together so yeah That's that was cool. fun and you want to use like quarto markdown or something like that to do it it's going to be something like that i'm not paying okay. for it it's going to be free okay then yeah. then you will need to learn at least a bit of github uh, ci cd but yeah I okay should, I, should, I should cross that bridge when i come to it that's good. <laughs> well, so we can all see each other next week. Hopefully, like my voice will be better. And bye. <laughs> nice to see you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank, you. Thank you for the presentation, bye. Will. Yeah, Cheers, thanks for thank the you. Bye. It was clear. <laughs>